Villain of the Week. Villain of the Week is P.T. Barnum, who was a businessman, author, politician, and most famously a carny. Within his life, he actually specifically said, I'll only be canonized for my exploits as a carnival man, whereas he really felt he was much more deeper than that. But based on reading his biography, he wasn't. Even in his business and political exploits, it was always a carnival circus to him. Would he and Harambe have been friends? This is the thing. He would have told the story that he and Harambe were friends, but he actually would have been the one whipping and probably killing Harambe. Oh. Because basically he whipping. he was quite a cruel man to the people in his traveling freak shows, as he so lovingly called them. The biggest discovery of his lifetime, this is him self-proclaiming it, was not how easy it is to deceive people, but how much people enjoy being deceived. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that really has to do with what we're talking about today. So he was famous for these these traveling shows, but also for these like curiosity museums mm -hmm. where he infamously had like a mermaid and a unicorn, like things like that that he just had assembled and put on display for people to say, wow, look, it's the, the skeleton of a mermaid. They must be real. And with his traveling shows, he basically just had a bunch of people of different ethnicities and gave them like funky names and was like, wow, look at these people. And he essentially realized that racism wasn't dead despite within his lifetime, slavery being abolished. Yeah. So people were thinking, oh, we're like improving our relationships to other humans but he was like, people still enjoy making fun of other yeah, people. Yeah, and here's like, a way to profit off of it. Here's that. a way to profit off of it. And I thought it was really interesting how, especially with the movie The Greatest Showman, which is about his life, if you watch that, you think he's a really great guy. He was like just getting together a band of misfits and giving mm. them purpose. Is very kind attractive, of the movie. Too. Yeah, very attractive. <laughs> I mean, and partners with Zac Efron, like, come on. So he, if you watch that, that's kind of similar to how we seem to reflect back on things, I think. But in reality, we have to kind of not let people rewrite their own stories so quickly. Do you think that freak show culture still exists today in some form? Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking of on with the internet. the internet. How? Of like his most famous act was this woman who looked really old and she said she was like 300 years old or something. Yeah. So she had to kind of do it to herself. Be like, yeah, yeah, I'm 300 years old. I think there is a crumbly old woman on the internet as well who's like a, a character. Perhaps. But people yeah. like meme themselves and I feel like that's not good for them. But they make money off of it. But I, I think it's just this circular us exploiting them, them exploiting us. He was just, a, I feel like he really encapsulated the showmanship of the internet really mm. well. He also is very like Trumpian in his... So you're saying he would have done well today? He would have done really well today, constantly pivoting like his political platform. He changed parties a bunch of times, similar to Trump. Why would why did people care about P.T. Barnum's politics? Well, he was in office. Oh, okay. He wasn't the president, but he was in office. He for was a, few a slippery terms. chameleon type snake oil. Okay. Yeah. I had some notes on some other animals that maybe P.T. Barnum would have liked, but at some point became sensational figures because mm -hmm. we were going to call this episode Harambe and Friends. So first one is Binky. Mm -hmm. He was a polar bear in the 90s. Uh, he was a polar bear in a zoo who in the 90s reached notoriety for not one, but multiple maulings of visitors. Most of which, again, just me looking out as an outsider, were the, were the fault of the visitors. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, polar bears are, I would say, famously quite brutal creatures. And yeah, they're bears. They're be generally, you want to keep your distance. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Binky is is kind of notable because I really implore people to go on his Wikipedia page and see the picture. He looks like a criminal. Yeah, it's it's slightly a favorite pastime of mine anyway to go on Wikipedia and see which public figures have the worst images on there because I mm -hmm. think Wikipedia has to take the ones that are like free use or whatever. Mm -hmm. And his <laughs> Looks like it's taken from about 200 feet away through a bunch of shrubbery, but he's still kind of eyeing the camera with the most guilty expression. And he has in his mouth the shoe of a tourist that he took, I guess, and maybe wore as some kind of medal of honor. So that's Binky. There's also Jambo, 
who was a gorilla in the 80s, some might say the proto Harambe, mm -hmm. the baseline store archetype from which Harambe deviated or the timeline shifted because Jambo protected the boy who fell into his enclosure. Mm -hmm. Because also these enclosures have like high drops. Yeah. So the kid basically fell into Jambo's enclosure and was unconscious. Mm -hmm. But the gorilla was like protecting it and stroking his back and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there's Congo, who I just wanted to mention because on the Wikipedia listing of famous apes, there is a subsection for artists. And mm. I was like, what is, most of them, it was just people who, uh, monkeys who were taught sign language. Okay. But Congo was a painter. I see. Picasso had one of his paintings. What? I think, yeah, I think a couple of them have been auction auctioned. He was gifted it. I think a couple of them were, were auctioned for like $25,000 or something like that. Okay. What kind of style do you think the paintings were in? Quite abstract. They were. Is my, they um, were quite abstract. My projection, yes. The exact genre was described as lyrical abstract impressionism. Mm. So the, actually this friend segment had no relevance to the rest of the episode. I just thought it'd be fun to mention. No, I think it has relevance. I like the names of these guys. Binky, Harambe, Jambo, Congo. They're funny names. I think it has relevance in our segue into designing a solo scene zoo because... A lot of people think, why are we keeping these highly intelligent creatures in <laughs> tiny enclosures which children can fall into? And I think that's kind of a good segue into... Yeah, so we thought we would end the episode by designing a zoo for the utopia, a utopian zoo as it were. Mm -hmm. And our, our, both of our first independent thoughts on this were, no zoo. That no would be zoo. The, the most yeah. utopian thing, no zoo. But then when you look into it, again, like I'm not an expert on the topic nor of animal ethics in general, but most zoos today aren't exactly P.T. Barnum whipping the the giraffes that he bred in captivity. Like mm -hmm. most of them are pretty good and they are a little bit, function a little bit more as sanctuaries. As sanctuaries. So I think what we can kind of say is good zoos are good. Bad zoos are bad. I mean, we've all been to a zoo and there's the bear or the tiger and you're like, that, Why doesn't, is look, that, here? that doesn't look good. Or in Montreal, there's a biodome, which you think would be a great example because it has four or five different areas, each of which doing a pretty good job at mimicking the... The natural habitat. Yeah, the biome. So there'll be like the plants and the rainforest areas. Like legit feels like you stepped into a rainforest. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the penguins and those ones, they don't look nice because their habitat is basically just like a really small icy kind of wall that they're trapped into mm -hmm. shout out to the montreal biodome but yeah so my thought on this i i'm glad i had the chance to think about it because my initial instinct is no zoos and my final instinct is no zoos because i think it's cool yeah like a lot of the animals in zoos today is they can't survive in yeah. the wild so it's kind of like they have to be in captivity and it's good for when there's a really small population of an animal, have them in captivity so they can kind of reproduce safely and then repopulate in terms of like when species are endangered and stuff. But I think it's the marveling at them that I just really hate. Yeah, the concept of it might kind of itself just reinforce that view of the exotic or that like othering of the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. But for instance, in Nova Scotia, somewhat close to my house there was a farm zoo mm -hmm. where they just had pretty regular farm animals and some of them were a little bit wilder but it was like horses alpacas llamas mm -hmm. deer birds things like this where they were mostly just roaming around and you could have a horse ride if you wanted well that's what i was gonna say i think these types of make, make them more like tours kind of interactive yeah a little interactive and just like i was also thinking it'd be really cool to have ecosystem zoos so like like the biodome, but just without the animals, kind of. I was thinking that too, because I was um, reminded of when we went to Mexico and we went to that weird moth enclosure. Yeah, a butterfly sanctuary. It was pretty much a greenhouse. It yeah. had really wonderful flowers and plants. Mm -hmm. And then there were just a ton of like the craziest butterflies you've ever seen as big as your face. Mm -hmm. And you kind of roamed through trying your hardest not to touch anything. Mm -hmm. like, I think things like that are kind of cool. Mm. But when you have like, a giraffe living in Nova Scotia, it just feels... 
Yeah, of course. Like, I just think that should be outlawed. I don't really understand why it's still legal. Another foundational text for this episode, Madagascar. Yes. And its sequels. Mm-hmm. Do you know there was, a, at the same time as Madagascar, Disney made a film that was like identical. Did you see really? that? No. Yeah. I don't remember the name of it. And I don't think I ever saw, but it was on, you know, when they used to sh- play trailers on DVDs, mm-hmm. like before the film, they weren't even optional. They were just yeah. there. It was like that. Oh. I think it might have been straight to TV. Interesting. I'll have to look into that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should. Just no exotic animals where they don't belong. Another meme I wanted to mention is the return to monkey. Do you know that? No. Yeah, return to monkey without the Y on the end. It's just monk. Monk. Okay. Know Your Meme calls it a series of memes closely associated with anarcho-primitivism. Okay. That romanticize a simplistic, archaic lifestyle. And the monkey is the symbol for said lifestyle. Because I was trying to think about lessons we could learn from the Harambe moment. And one thing I think, I think part of the reason it resonated so much, even ironically, is that it was a gorilla. Like, I don't think it would have been the same if it were a bear. Let me put it like that. True. Because I think it was us seeing, sounds so ridiculous, but seeing some of ourselves in Harambe or some of ourselves that has been lost. And maybe it's this kind of, this is definitely a reach, but this kind of acknowledgement that the the forums and the medium on which we were propagating the Harambe meme was so distant from the Harambe being, because it was all digital, right? It was all internet. And even this sense that we have gradually or unwittingly made ourselves into a kind of evolution of the original human You know, nerd neck, Mm -hmm. that's the name for it. Neck posture. Yeah. From craning at screens all day, like that. 